Well, Cottage Hill is 76 years old, and God is still writing the story of Cottage Hill. Amen. I want to invite you to take your Bible this morning and find the book there in the Old Testament, the book of Judges. It may take you a minute or two to find it, but the book of Judges in chapter number two. We are in a, a teaching series, but it's much more than a series. It is more of a strategy, a vision for Cottage Hill for the next 18 months. Several months ago, I began really just meeting with the Lord and asking him this question, Lord, what's next for our church? What's next for our great church of Cottage Hill? And really, I began to ask even on a more personal note of of God, what's next for me? What what do you have for me in my life and my ministry? And as I began to meet with the Lord in my quiet time and my devotions and just searching and seeking the scriptures, I just felt in impressed upon the Lord, greatly impressed upon the Lord that what is next for me and what's next for our church is that we are to be very intentional about investing in the next generation. In the last couple of weeks, I've shared with you some of those various verses, Psalm 145 and verse 4, we just looked at that video and one of these themes about generation after generation, communicating, telling the story, sharing the faith, making sure the next generation carries the gospel and has a very real and genuine faith. There are a lot of good things that we can do for our children. We can provide a loving home for our children. We can provide a good education for our children. We can do everything that we can to make sure that our children have good opportunities. And those are good things, but the greatest thing that we can do for our children, for the next generation, and that is to give them a genuine faith. And we're finding today in our culture in America, that's becoming more and more difficult. In fact, statistically, we are losing a generation. And we wonder what's what's happening and what can we do. And we gather for an hour or two on Sunday and we do everything we can as a church to communicate the gospel, but the reality of it is the next generation, we're, we're losing it. Because this next generation, they're they're listening and they're hearing and they're being bombarded with these other voices that that are battling the voice of God and the voice of faith. This next generation, our children today, they're hearing and they're being bombarded every day with the voice of secularism. And secularism tells them that as they grow, as they mature, They don't need God in their life. In fact, there is no God. And they're being bombarded with that in every direction. The the voice of secularism, there is no God. Therefore, you don't need him in your life. They're not only being bombarded with the voice of secularism, but they're being bombarded with the voice of, of materialism that says that as you grow, as you mature, that if you want to be happy, happiness is found in things. So be sure to get a job, find an occupation in which you can make as much money as you can so that you can buy the things that bring happiness. And you know as well as I do, those images and those voices of materialism are bombarding, they're flooding our kids with that message. So they hear and they see the message of secularism and materialism, but then also hedonism. And hedonism is this philosophy of that if it feels good, if you want it, do it, get it, have it. That really this life is simply about pleasures. It's about having fun. It's about being in, having an enjoyable time. And our kids today, this next generation is being bombarded 
with these voices. And as a result, we are losing a generation. So God began to show me that in my life, forever how many years I have left on this earth, I am to pour into, I am to invest in the next generations, to be a part of something, to, to build something that will outlast me. And that for our church is to, is to be a, a part of some things that will outlast us. Because the day will come that I won't be here, you won't be here, but this building will be here. And people will be buried and people will be baptized and babies will be born. So what can we be a part of that it's bigger than we are and that will outlast us? As I was seeking, seeking these scriptures, these various passages, they, they began to just penetrate my heart. But there's one particular verse in, in scripture that I, I came across that just gripped my heart. It's found in the book of Judges in chapter 2. And I'm going to ask you to stand just in reverence of the reading of God's word. Judges chapter 2 and verse number 10. And what you and I are about to read, by the way, refers to Joshua's generation. And it says in Joshua, uh, Judges chapter 2 and verse number 10, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. If you have a pencil or a pen, there's really just a couple of things that you and I are going to look at this morning. And the first thing that you and I are going to look at is this fact, this reality of what we're seeing today, and that is losing a generation. What is haunting about the verse that you and I just read is that this is Joshua's generation. This is the same people who stepped foot in the river Jordan at flood time and God stopped the waters and God escorted his people into the promised land. This is Joshua's generation. This is the same people who watched God knock down the walls of Jericho. This is the same people that I witnessed and participated in miracle after miracle after miracle. And the Bible says that their children, when they grew up, did not know the Lord, did not believe, did not follow. How, how does that happen? How does it happen that an entire generation that are eyewitnesses to the miracles of God fail to pass on their faith to their children. But the Bible says they lost an entire generation. So I believe in, in analyzing that and seeing what happened thousands of years ago and what I believe is we're seeing today, even in America, one of three things happened. One is that Joshua's generation just simply failed to tell their children about God. I mean, there's only really two or three explanations. One is that they just failed to tell the children. But you see, the reality of this, I don't believe that. I just believe that at various times in the evening, this generation, these parents, I believe they loved to tell their children about the miracles. So one of the explanations is they didn't tell their kids about it, but, but I don't think that's the case. Now, there's another explanation, and that is the kids just simply refuse to listen. And really, that's not hard to believe that kids might not listen to their parents. But would that explain an entire generation? Certainly, some of the kids refuse to listen to their parents. But all of them? Probably not. There's a third explanation and it's what I believe. I believe that that generation did not share their faith in such a way as that 
the next generation could understand it. Let me say that again. My, my belief is, and the only way to explain it, I believe that certainly would be believable, is that this generation, in sharing their faith to the next generation, just did not do it in a way that they could understand. And the reason I'm so confident in that explanation is because we see that happening today in our nation. You say, Alan, what do you mean? I mean this. And we know this to be true. Every generation is different. Every generation has its own music. Every generation has its own heroes. Every generation has, for example, its own technology. For example, this, this gaming generation, it, it completely skipped me. When I was growing up, we had Pong. I don't know if you, many of you are familiar with Pong, but that's pretty much all we had. So we just, by the time I became an adult, that's when the gaming thing came around. I just, it completely missed me. But my sons are gamers. They, they, they grew up, they were playing video games, and they would invite me. Dad, come play this game with us. We got a new game. Dad, come play with us. Well, I want to spend time with my boys. And so we would go, and we'd go, we'd call the man cave, and we would play the video. And they loved playing dad, because why? They could just beat the socks off of me. It didn't matter the game. I wanted to spend time with my boys, but I don't like losing. And it wouldn't be just like a beating. It would be like 40,000 to nothing. And I'm like, I don't know why I do this. Oh, dad, you're, you're getting so much better. Wink, wink, nod, nod. I'm like, I know I'm not getting better. Yeah, you know, last time it was like 50,000 and nothing. But every generation speaks a different language, communicate a different way. And, and what I believe happened here, and what I believe that we're seeing in many ways in our own nation is we have to understand this reality, is that Christianity is just one generation away from extinction. Christianity is just one generation away from extinction. There is a whole generation out there that we are losing. We know it. We see it statistically in our nation. And what I believe the reason is, is not that we don't have faith but we're failing to communicate our faith to the next generation in a way that they get it, in a way that they understand it. So if you and I are gathering and we're thinking about, hey, this celebrates 76 years as a church, but what's next? What does the future of our church look like? I'm going to tell you what it looks like. It looks like that we become very intentional about taking what we have and what we know and communicating it to the next generation. Now, by the way, let me say this. The message of Cottage Hill will always be the same. To connect people to Jesus Christ and one another. We take the great commission of our Lord Jesus and we take the great commandment of our Lord Jesus and we take t these two things and we say this is the mission and this is the message and this is the purpose of Cottage Hill to connect people to Jesus Christ and one another. So the purpose will never change, but the methodology, how we communicate it to the next generation, must be different. It must change. So you would say, Alan, okay, we're with you, we're tracking with you. What has to take place? Even in my own life, not just, by the way, our church, but what about my life and what about your life? If you're really going to live and leave a legacy in such a way that's, that outlives you, that's bigger than you, there's two questions that you have to ask. There's two questions that you must ask yourself or allow God this morning to ask you. The first is this, do I care? about the next generation. Do I care? Do I really care? Because the truth is, most of the time we don't. Every generation cares about their own. 
Every generation cares about what we like and what we want. That's the selfish way. That's the natural way. But if we really step back and say, do I really care about the kids? Do I really care about the next generation? Do I really care about them? Because I will say this, if you really care, you want to do something about it. So there are some of you here this morning that what you need to begin to pray is God place on my heart a burden, a passion, a desire for the next generation because my natural tendency is just to be about me and what I like and what I want. But I know that if I'm going to leave something, if I'm going to impact, if I'm going to leave a legacy, I need to care about the next generation. And this really, by the way, that's what next is about. It's about caring for the next generation and caring enough to actually do something about it. So the first question you have to ask, do do I care? Do I care about the next generation? Here's the second question. Are you ready? Do I really believe this book? Do I really believe this book? Let me just be be very bold. If we don't believe this book today, we just need to close it and close the doors and go home. But if we would say, well, yes, Pastor, yes, Alan, I, I, I believe the book. I believe that of what it says, I believe there is a heaven, I believe there is a hell, I believe there are two things that last forever, the word of God and people. And they either spend forever in heaven or a very real place called hell. But I believe the book. I believe that God has created and that God has designed every man, every woman, every boy, every girl with a purpose and a plan. And ultimately that is for them to be in heaven with God, the creator and the redeemer. So if I really care, if I do care about the next generation, and I do really believe this book, then I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to invest my life. I'm going to invest my time. I'm going to invest my my talents and that which will last forever. If it's true, if this book is true, and I care about the next generation, that it's worth my time, it's worth my life. Because if we don't, we're gonna lose a generation. Let's talk, about, let's talk about winning a generation. Let's let's shift gears, let's pivot and talk about winning a generation. One of the things that I love about American history, what I love reading about, and even when motion pictures depict it. But I love reading about the early land rushes in American history. I love reading and I love those movie depictions in which you would have hundreds and hundreds of people lined up. Some are on foot, some are on horseback, some are on wagons, but they each have a stake in their hand. And the gun goes off and this mad rush, a race, to stake your claim. This is our property. This is our land. And that land that that was claimed would be in that family and would be in that family for generations. We We have homesteads in our nation that are generations old because in the very beginning, one man, one family staked their claim. I love that imagery. I love that idea because I think with us being 76 years old as a church, I believe as we see the landscape and we see what's happening in our nation, we see what's happening in losing a generation, what I see today that is crucial is that every family today needs to stake their claim. We talked last week about different types of soil. I think there's different kinds of land that we stake. 
There is, for example, there's a family that can stake their claim in the land of commitment. The land of commitment is when both mom and dad are Christians. Mom and dad are believers. They attend church. They're faithful in church. They're active in church. They're serving in church. And their kids see it. Their kids know it. Their kids witness it. And what this mom and dad have, listen carefully, is a real, genuine faith. So when there's a problem, they see mom and dad pray about it. When there are issues in the family, they they talk about it and they pray about it and they discuss it with a faith perspective. And when someone does something they shouldn't, when dad does something he shouldn't, there is forgiveness. And what mom and dad display to their kids is a real genuine faith. Mom and dad and the family are active, they're involved, they're serving, they're giving, they're going. They're very generous when it comes to the church and to the ministry and to the gospel, to the faith. That mom, that dad have staked their claim in the land of commitment. Bruce Wilkinson a few years ago was a part of a survey across America. What they discovered was this. When those kids witness and grow up in a real, genuine faith the majority, the vast majority of those kids grow up to have a growing, nurturing, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There are some families who do that. They just stake their claim in the land of commitment. There are other families who stake their claim in the land of compromise. Pastor, what is the land of compromise? Well, mom and dad are Christians, but they are half-hearted Christians. They don't, well, they attend church somewhat regularly. But here's what the kids see. They don't see a faith actually lived out. Not in practical ways. Not in decision-making. Not financially. Not with their time. Not with their talents not with their treasure. What they witness and what they see are a half-hearted faith. That same survey, by the way, those kids, less than half when they grow up have a personal relationship with Jesus. Less than half. You see, to stake your claim in the land of compromise is a very dangerous thing to your children. The majority do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. There's a third kind of land. It's the land of confusion. And this is where mom and dad, they are not Christians. They're not saved. There's not a spiritual emphasis. There's not spiritual discussions. They have zero interest in spiritual things. They are lost. And those kids, by the way, same study, those kids, as they grow up, there is a bit confusion because what they see is that there's something's missing, something's not right. And for those kids that grow up, when they hear the gospel, when they're invited to church, they respond to it. They respond to the gospel, and they come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And watch this. Look up here. Catch your eye. Look, look at me. Look, listen to your pastor. More kids come to faith in Christ as they get older. More kids come to faith in Christ as they get older. The, more of those in a non-Christian home, more of those kids than a half-hearted Christian's home. So here, let me just make it plain. It's very dangerous to raise your children in a half-hearted Christian home. And so that's really what our church needs to be about, is how do we Stake a claim 
And how do we do the sort of things that are necessary in order to impact the next generations? So let me tell you the passion of my life. I have a twofold passion of my life. Kathy and I have two sons. The number one passion of my life is that as my sons get older and older, that they would say of their dad, he wasn't perfect, but he had a real and a genuine faith. The second passion that I have is not when I'm gone that people would say, Alan was a good pastor and the church grew. But what it would be said is, he left a legacy in which the church invested and poured into the generations to come. It's what I want for my life. It's what I want for our church. But here's what it means. Here's what it takes. It, it means to be all in. It means to be all in as a Christian. It means mom. It means dad. It means for you to be all in. Because you think being half hearted, half committed, you think that, well, I'm, at least I'm doing some good for our kids, not statistically. They never see the reality of the faith and how the faith is lived out. So when they get older, they just dismiss it and they don't want any part of it. So it's what the next 18 months is about. Three parts. First, to improve. We have 30-year-old buildings and we have 60-year-old buildings on this campus. We have to make some repairs. We have to do some things that can help us with regard to our facility. The second part is that we're going to partner with our campus on Dolphin Island, our campus downtown, and we're going to impart our DNA in another church that's dying. Because churches today in America, the projection is over the next 18 months, 20,000 or more churches will close its doors. Do you know why? Because they didn't successfully communicate the gospel to the next generation in a way that they understood it. And now they're dying. So our hope is that we partner with other churches and come alongside them and help breathe new life into them. There's a third aspect of this 18-month strategy, and that is to specifically and intentionally impact the next generation. We're going to do that two or three, four different ways. One is we're going to take on some projects. I met just the past week with one representative from the Alabama Baptist Children's Home, meeting with another executive this week. How can we be a part of something unique and special? Our own Women's Resource Center. How can we save, rescue, and protect the most vulnerable? We're going to launch here specifically a preteen ministry focusing on the fifth and sixth graders, that next generation. We're asking you to join me in praying that God would raise up out of our church those called to the ministry pastors, preachers, teachers, worship leaders, children, students, missionaries. And we'll pour into those to impact the generations to come. So, Alan, what does that mean for me? Three things. Number one, join. If you are not a member of the Cottage Hill family, listen, my one word for you, join. This is what our church is going to be doing with great intentionality. Join. Join. Others of you, I would say to you, join in. Get in on what we're going to do. Serve, participate, invest time, invest your ability, your skill set. Join in. Join, join in. And number three, give. Give generously so that we can do more student camps and student retreats and launch a preteen ministry. We can invest in the preschool, the students, the children, the college age. Young adults and the ones that are most vulnerable, we can reach and minister to. 
we're looking at um, some new partnerships internationally. One of the partnerships that intrigues me that we're exploring is, is with a ministry in Stockholm, Sweden. Sweden, listen to this, less than 1% of the entire population goes to church. Less than 1% of the entire population goes to church. When you look across Sweden, churches everywhere, beautiful churches. The few people who attend are the elderly. You know why? They failed to communicate their faith to the next generation in a way they could understand it. Do you care about the next generation? Do you believe this book? Then let's be all in. And let's do something about it. Would you pray with me? Just bow your head for just a moment. Our band's going to come, lead us in a, a song. We're going to prepare our hearts to receive communion, the Lord's Supper. Moms, dads, what kind of land have you staked your claim? Can you with boldness, can you with confidence, can you say, hey, pastor, our family isn't perfect, it's far from perfect, but what we try to do, what we try to exhibit is a very real and genuine faith that's lived out. You have staked your claim in the land of commitment, praise God. There are some of you here that would be honest enough to, with, with yourself and honest with God, and that you've staked the claim of compromise. And when it comes to prayer, and when it comes to decisions, and when it comes to generosity, and when it comes to your time, and when it comes to your investment, you're half-hearted. And your kids see it. And they've seen it. It's time to be real, and it's time to be all in. And for us as a church, we have to ask ourselves, am I more concerned about what I like and what I want as opposed to truly caring about the next generation? Do I care? And do I believe the book? Because if I care and I believe the book, then I want to do everything I can to be a part of something The altar is open for moms and dads. Pastors are going to be here in the front. You want to trust Christ? If you want to know how to join the church, we have our next Discover class in a week and a half. Sign up at the atrium desk. Tell one of these pastors. They'd love to pray with you, love to pray for you. The altar is open, but it's time for us to do business. Let's stand together. Let's come before the Lord together. And let's be honest with the Lord together. Would you bow your head with me? The altar is open. God, we come clean before you. And we admit where we have failed. Where we have failed as as a dad or as a mom, as a family. Lord, forgive us. But Lord, help us to begin living our life and displaying in our home a real faith, a genuine faith, a lived out faith, a practiced faith in decision making and how we spend our time how we love, how we forgive, how we pray, how we give, how we go. 
God help us. Help us to live out our real faith. Lord, for these this morning who need to give their life to you, in sincerity and honesty to turn from their sin and turn from their selfishness and to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray for a courage and a boldness to, to step out in faith today. For these who need to join, for these who need to join in, I pray they would make that decision today. Lord, I pray that the decisions that we make today will bear fruit for generations to come. I pray for the homes today who need to stake their claim. Lord, I pray in these next moments for humility, for obedience. And I pray it in Jesus' name.